Christian tonight, I thank you that they're grounded in the truth of Scripture. You know, we have to watch. There can be a catchy song on Christian radio, and it's not grounded in the truth of Scripture. And doctrinally, it's not sound. And everything we sang tonight was truth about our God, that He's faithful. He's faithful to a thousand generations, and that He's good. And that surely goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our lives. Amen? And when we're singing a song, it should automatically be able to take us to Scripture in our mind. Number one, that means that we know the Scripture, amen? Because Holy Spirit can't bring it back to our remembrance if it's not already in there. So that's going to know that we're already into the Word and that we already have His Scripture deeply embedded within us. But also, it means that if a song can bring Scripture to your mind, then guess what? That song lines up with Scripture. And we sang God's truths tonight. We sang truths about His character and His nature tonight. And what more could he want to hear than his people giving him praise and singing truth back to him? Amen. Yeah. I like it. All right. So that was free. I feel like I always have like a free little nugget after praise and worship, you know, because because it's just so good. But um, so <laughs> I didn't know what kind y'all liked, so no. <laughs> we have cockeye barbecue in our in our uh, fridge. So, um, but I couldn't think of how else to describe it tonight. But it's been such it's been such a fun ride the last couple of weeks as I've prepared messages for Wednesday night, and I've never really thought of it like that before. But um, you know, I was talking to Dara Lee a couple of weeks ago, and she was. Um, commenting on the worthy of it all message, and I says, oh my goodness, it is nothing like what it started out as. Like when I started to put that together and what it ended up being, even what it ended up being once I got here from when I left my house to me getting here and delivering it and the, the response and all that, like it's just amazing to see how, you know, and especially it's been very notable to me just in these last couple of weeks and even today as I sat and, and studied and wrote and, and everything, it was just like, wow, what I thought I was starting with or what I did start with and what is going to be presented to you tonight are like more of what I started with is going to be next week than anything because like what today ended up being was so far away from like, God just took it all in a different direction. It's just so cool to see, you know? And it's so neat that, um, that we can see that as I can see, that as, like, a message begins to grow, you know, and what that does and, and, and to become what the kingdom wants it to be. And then if we think of that for our own lives, you know, how many of us grow to where we become what the kingdom wants and needs us to be, right? We don't start out or we don't end up like what we started as, you know, when we're singing tonight about God is always faithful, and I'm like, Psh, you know, I have not always been faithful, but you have been, and that's miraculous to me because I know how hard it is, and I've fallen flat on my face before, but you're faithful to a thousand generations. You're faithful, and so we see that where we started is not where we ended up, and it's so that we can serve and so that we can be used by the by the kingdom of God and to further the kingdom of God. And it's kind of the same premise tonight that has happened or over these last couple of weeks with the messages also. And so um, I don't know if you've enjoyed the ride, but I'm like, I'm loving it right now, okay? I'm like the roller coaster kid. You know, I can't spin in circles, but put me on any roller coaster that you can. And I'm just like, yeah. And uh, that's kind of what I feel like right now, guys. Like it's exciting and we're in the front car and like, here we go. This is good, right? And um, so anyway, the title for the message this evening, I'm like really excited, I'm sorry. Um, the title for the message is called A Lecture of Love, Lessons to a Lukewarm Laodicea. Lessons of Love, or sorry, A Lecture of Love, Lessons to a Lukewarm Laodicea. Now it's not me who's going to be doing the lecturing, so you don't have to worry, okay? It was Christ who did the lecturing through John, um, who's also referred to as John the Revelator, right? When he penned the words of the book of Revelation. And so no worries, you're not getting any lectures from Pastor Rose this evening, okay? That'll, we'll save that for another time. But um, the portion of scripture that we're going to be looking at and that we're going to start off reading is one that I'm sure is going to be familiar to us, that we've all been in before, 
Okay, but as we begin to unpack some things tonight, I pray that you're just as woed and as wowed as what I have been as I've been studying. Yeah, Ashley's back there like, whoa. <laughs> That's like, I hope I see like jaw dropping awesomeness come across your face every now and then, okay? But um, basically, Laodicea was the one that like brought up the rear in the writings of to the seven churches, right? Um, and as the book is titled, it's called, you know, it's not called the Revelation of John, right? What's it called? The Revelation of Jesus Christ, okay? So it was the Revelation of Jesus Christ to the people. It was just penned by John. And so, you know, he's already went through this message that Christ gave for the other six churches, and now the seventh one, okay, that we finally read of is, is found in Revelation chapter 3, and we're going to be reading from verses 14 through 22. This portion of scripture that I read is going to be out of the New King James Version this evening. Uh, and the heading is called, in, in my Bible, the heading was called the Lukewarm Church. So starting in verse 14 of chapter 3. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful, look at that, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold or hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Verse 17, because you say I am rich, have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and you do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Verse 18, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eye with eye salve that you may see. Verse 19, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Verse 20, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. And verse 22, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, right? Wow. So each of the congregations that were written to, okay, and this is going to be a lot of like, history lessons tonight. This is going to be a lot of like that kind of stuff, like just kind of getting into the fun of all of it, okay? And so um, these congregations that were written to were from like Asia Minor, and that's modern day Turkey, okay? Um, each of them, if we started kind of down here and went around, each of them were in a clockwise motion, the seven churches. If you started here at Ephesus and you went around to all the seven churches, you're going to end or stop with Laodicea, the seventh church, okay? And there was a big highway that went through the land that was kind of shaped like a triangle of sorts. And all of these cities were on like this pathway or this roadway, okay? Um, each of them were spoken in order of how they were found as you were traveling, okay? Um, it's been referenced, and this is like a point of contention for some people, not for myself, but for some. Um, it's been referenced by many biblical scholars, by many commentary writers, um, by many end-time strategists, that each of these churches also represent a distinct time in history in the church age, Okay, um, this is debated by some, but I can see how others come to that conclusion. Okay, so what that would mean is if he's talking to the church at Ephesus, that that would have been like the beginning of the dispensation of the churches. That was like when the church age was starting out. And then as you went along, you could kind of follow through until you get to the church of Laodicea, the lukewarm church, the spit out church, we get to the end times church, right? We get to the rapture, we get to the great falling away, we get to all of those things, and that those type of end time scriptures can be seen um, or paralleled with the writings of the church of Laodicea. Have we ever heard that before? That the, the churches have been also like the dispensation of time. Okay, so um, I can see how people find that in scripture, okay? I found it also myself. I can see how, oh yeah, that makes sense, all right? And so 
I believe that God is awesome enough that he can have his word fit to those exact cities and churches that he's speaking to at the time that John is writing to them, and that his word can also fit to the different time periods of the churches, amen, because he's God. And so he can make that happen, right? Now, it happens in other portions of Scripture as well. And if that's the case for this portion as well, it's what's known as the duality of Scripture. All that is is a fancy word for meaning that, like, Scripture can be applied literally to the time or the people it was being written to, but can also be applied to something we're going through in our own life. Have we ever read a Scripture and it just, like, perfectly fit what we were going through at, in our life at that time? Yeah, that's what it's for, Right. But it also had some other meaning or some other fit that it had when it was first written as well, okay? A parable that Jesus spoke or whatever. So that would be the duality of Scripture. God is awesome enough that his words can be fitting to more than one time period or more than one person, all right? Does that make sense? Okay, so we can find commonalities maybe between our brothers and sisters in those churches of that day and what is spoken of by, about them and what we see happening in modern church culture of today as well, okay? So some of the same things, you can parallel them or you can see them. Oh, this is what Laodicea was like? Well, guess what? That's what the church sometimes looks like today as well, all right? And so um, maybe attitudes or occurrences or happenings in our world today are also going to be reflected in the words that we read about this lukewarm church, okay? Now, I don't believe it's a great, great stretch of the imagination to think that God had us in mind when he moved on John to write these things. He knew who was going to, John probably had no clue, right, that his book was going to be canonized and that it was going to be put in scriptures and that people all over the world 2,000 years later were going to be reading the things that he penned down after being... Um, I wanted to say quarantined on the island. Like, how much is that stuff, like, in our brain that that's the first word that we come to? Okay, but when he was banished to the Isle of Patmos, right, and he gets this revelation from God and he writes all of these things, he had no idea that we would be reading them and, and, and grasping truth from them 2,000 years later. But guess what? God did. Amen? Yes. So, um, and God knew that when he spoke to John. And God knew that when Revelation 21, 25 was written. And it's one of my favorite, favorite verses in the Bible. It says, write, for these words are faithful and true. And there's so many times where I just hear God say, write, for these words I give you are faithful and true. Amen. So if we happen to see any traits in them, okay, that we currently see in ourselves, all right, because it's easy to go, oh, yeah, the church, yeah, I can see it in the church, and we just make the church out to be like this scapegoat sometimes, right, when actually, guess what, we're a part of the church, <laughs> okay, so maybe we're going to see some things referenced that we go, oh, ouch, like, Pastor Rose, you said you weren't going to lecture me. I'm not. It's God's word, not mine, <laughs> okay? But um, so we need to take these lessons, all right, that were given to them, okay, and apply them to ourselves in the places that they fit and in the places that they need applied to, okay, just like other portions of the word. And so um, think of this, like if myself and someone else were told of negative consequences that were going to happen if we continued on the same path, but we still continued on the same path. And that other person is ahead of me, and all of a sudden I see all those negative consequences starting to be like to befall them. Guess what? If I'm smart, I'm going to do what? Yeah. I'm going to like cut and run, right? I'm going to go, oh, let me learn from you so that I don't have to fall in the same hole or make the same mistakes. Don't we tell that to our children all the time, right? Learn from the stupid things I did so that you don't have to do them yourself, right? And so if we can do that here, okay, maybe it's going to be an owl step on your toes moment that God reveals something to you. But if he reveals something in you, it's because he loves you, okay? And the best thing to do is to take care of it right then, all right? And so I want us to remember that. And so if we heed those warnings and those things, okay? And so when we read of Laodicea's dangerous mindsets that they had and need the the complacency that they had fallen into, you know, that's what we can think of when we think of the word lukewarm. 
You know, Christ is saying, I'd rather you be hot or cold. One of the other, like pick one. You know, like Joshua, like pick, choose you this day. Whom are you going to serve? Are you going to serve Baal or are you going to serve God? Like you got to pick one. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord, right? Jesus is saying, like, I wish you were either hot or cold. Like, make up your mind. But this, like, trying to ride the fence thing isn't going to work anymore. Like, I want you to be one or the other, and instead you're lukewarm, and I don't want lukewarm. I don't want lukewarm coffee. I either want hot coffee or I want iced coffee. I don't want lukewarm coffee, right? That's why I have to heat up my same mug of coffee, like, five times during the morning, okay? Because it starts to get cold, and I'm like, eh, I don't want this. So I got to throw it in the nuker for 30 more seconds, right? Because I either want iced coffee or hot coffee. I don't want lukewarm coffee, okay? And Christ is saying, I wish you were either hot or cold. But since you're not, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. I'm going to vomit you out of your mouth. These are strong words that he's using here, okay? And so we see these dangerous mindsets that we have. And, and we see that um, Christ warns what's going to happen if they stick with them, all right? And so when he does that... It would be common sense then to avoid those things, wouldn't it? And it really is that simple. It really is that simple. Is This is what's going to befall you if you continue down the same path. So don't continue down the same path, right? It's what I call a (laughs) no-brainer, and you would think so. But um, this next part is what I absolutely love, 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 okay? And this um, has this woe factor, all right? And... um, We're going to break down verse 18 that we read there, and I want you to see some different things of the why behind why Jesus says stuff. And I try to instill, especially now, like I'm on the third child, so like I've learned a lot over the last two kids, right? Especially because I got to almost like raise them completely before like I even had the third one, okay? So I'm I'm going, oh, you know what? I did this, and they turned out like this, and that was good, so I'll continue that. And, oh, I don't think I did enough of this, and they turned out like this over here, so I'm going to change that about this one, right? And so when we get to these things, okay, one of them that I always talk about is not giving the why all the time. Like, I have to tell myself to not always give the why behind why I'm asking Isaac to do something. Because what does every child from the time they can talk ask? Why? And me being the mom, I have the answers, so I'm going to answer the whys, right? Because I like having the answer to the whys, because I ask why a lot. Inside myself, when I'm praying, (laughs) I want to know why, right? And then I got, wow, how is his faith in God going to be strengthened to where he just obeys God even when he doesn't know the why behind it? Because most of the time, God doesn't tell us the why, does he? It's more like a because I said so, or I don't have time to explain it to you, duck, why do you want me to duck? Well, I don't have time to tell you why I need you to. I just need you on the floor right now, right? And so if we instill in our children all the time that every time they ask why, they're going to get an answer, and then they just have to have this quote-unquote blind faith to follow God no matter what, even when they don't know the why, there's going to be a great disparity between those two, right? So I don't answer why all the time anymore. But I still like to have why answered for me. And so what this scripture does, if we study a little bit, is we get the why behind why Jesus said these things to this church, okay? And that's what we're going to go into. And so um, at least for this one thing that he says in scripture, we can know why he said it. And so that's kind of exciting, I think. But it's in chapter 3, verse 18, when he says, I counsel from you to buy of me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see. You guys, like, hold on to your seats right now, because this is so good, okay? So we're going to look at why he said these things, and especially these three things specifically, okay? So number one is that they were already rich, okay? It's a common belief that John penned the book of Revelations around 96 AD, so think of that. Like, John's an older man now, right? Um, And so he penned this around 96 AD after Christ had died, okay? And this is important when we look at, like, the history of Laodicea at the time then, um, and at the time that Jesus gave this revelation to John. And so if we go back and look at their history, so back in, like, 17 AD, they have an earthquake, And it doesn't completely decimate the city, but it does tons of damage to the city, okay? And Rome, 
says, you know what, we'll help you rebuild. We'll give you money. We'll give you resources. We will help you. We want to help you rebuild all the damage that happened. And Laodicea says, yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Okay, and so they do. And then 17 from 60, 43 years later, there's another huge earthquake. Okay, this one's even worse. It's in 60 AD, and the town is just decimated, completely destroyed. There's just like no stone left on top of a 